All right, welcome to part six, the last part of my series looking at uh, Karl Bau's creation in the 21st century, an episode called Fossils Galore uh, featuring Ian Juby of the Canadian Creation Museum, whatever. Um, and now, now the first part was in three was cut into three separate clips, and it took me five of my clips in order to address all of it. Um, and yet I'm doing all of part two, which is also three separate clips in just one part. And this is because now I'm going to explain this and hopefully not too painful of detail uh, is that in this all three in this in this portion of it, he doesn't do a whole lot of biology. He's not looking at a lot of the actual fossils and things he's um, or when he is. It's mostly regarding um, sedimentation events, geology. OK. Now I, I I have a bit of background in geology, uh, not enough to where I feel really qualified or competent to discuss um, this whole lithification processes, and um, I certainly don't know the Grand Canyon well enough, you know, to go into what's what's wrong with his explanation. He goes into long detail in this in this series um, about the Grand Canyon and about how it proves sudden catastrophic deposition and subsequent erosion within days. Okay, he, he explains most of this video was taken up with that and also evidence of, of alien versus um, water deposited sandstones and such. So I thought if anybody oh familiar or knowledgeable with a good background in those kinds of processes um you know, not, I don't want to put anybody on the spot, of course, but anybody who's, you know, anybody out there who actually does have a good background in that, um, and especially if it's somebody who's tired of making Nephi videos, um, hint, hint, this would be a, gr I would love to, if you would make a series, you know, that could dovetail with this, you know, sort of going into his geology, because it's, it's, I know it's wrong, and I know why it's wrong, I just don't have the background knowledge to explain it in a concise, well, concise is the right word. I don't have the background to explain it in a way um, that I that I'm really confident about. So, I, I guess I'm just going to get started. Special reason for that. I have a very dear and special guest that I always enjoy having on the program. Now, uh, he digs fossils. He examines fossils. He's a scholar. Uh, he's a professor, lecturer. Okay, the, the, the only reason I showed this clip here is just because it's a great example. Um, he does this again in, in, in other portions, and I didn't, I don't, I, I didn't include him um, in the prior parts. Um, but he likes to. He, 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 this is an example of him referring to uh, Ian Juby as professor. Um, now it's it's very interesting to me. I've, I think he calls him doctor at one point in time. He also refers to him as Professor Juby. Uh, it's just a great example of how Albao and um, his group, his particular crowd um, of associates, are really pretty loose with the titles that they love to throw out titles on. They love to bestow, you know. And uh, it, obviously, it's of comes of little surprise when you're look, you're talking about a guy, Carl Bao himself, who has three PhDs, all of them from non-accredited university and he was there as we actually broke the layer off and he was there I, uh, one of our workers said director look at this I glanced over and that particular fossil was in place there phalacinoides fossils that's a strange word so don't mean to get technical to uh, that's that's a little sea creature worm-like creature in the Cretaceous now this is quite laughable here uh, because I know I'm pretty sure that Bao knows this isn't true. Uh, Thalassinoides is a term given to fossilized burrows of mud shrimps. Okay, mud shrimps are a group. They're they're called the thalassinids. Is a group that they're, that they all belong to. There's actually two different infra orders of crustaceans. Um, they used to be one. Uh, Callionassa in Australia. The guys call them yabbies. Um, let's see. They're blue mud shrimp in the United States. Others of ghost shrimp. Uh, these are these are forms that burrow into, and they love to burrow into clays. They love to burrow into. They don't burrow into rock, but they burrow into um, fairly fairly thickened clays. Also soft sediments, or really soft sediments as well. Um, and they make 
elongate long burrows that fossilize really well because they, after the shrimp dies and stops maintaining the burrow, they fill in with sediments and they make they make um, odd burrows. Now, again, I think I mentioned in another video at some point in time. I talked about these. Um, I've seen them for sale at rock shops in the Pacific Northwest as fossil antlers because some of these are branching and they look like you might think they're an antler. Um, they're also they're sold as different kinds of um, they're, they're under different names. Um, one of which that I think is fun not, not sold is that Carl Bau himself parades around with a, uh, a piece of a Thalassinoides burrow that he calls a fossilized human finger because it's sort of finger shaped. Um, so they're, it's kind of laughable. And, and when you actually excavate these burrows out, um, now I don't know about the ones in the Austin Chalks. I know about the ones in the, uh, the formations in Western Washington. When you get, if you can actually dig through and get pull out the whole burrow. Um, you get to the bottom of it, you can actually find the shrimp in the distal end of the burrow, which is pretty cool. A lot of times you'll find it um, either pieces of its molt or the whole thing kind of rolled up in a ball, always in pieces at the bottom of the um, of, of the thalassinoides. Um, so I, that's just made me laugh that he that he is claiming that this is a worm, and it's kind of, it, it that that distinction is kind of important for the next thing he's going to say. This is incredibly important because Professor Clark is a world-class fluid hydrolysist and he works in cementation and how long it would take for that layer to form. Now, that fossil has four inches of vertical structure and then he bends and goes inward. We do not how, know how far inward, but the bulk of his body was inward for him to be able to bend and try to get out of this. Now, according to evolutionary scenario, every inch of this layer, because it has a lot of clams in it, it has a lot of disassociated clam shells, but basically clam shells that have been moved by water and are still intact. Mm -hmm. They were buried alive. It took from 2,000 to 2 million years. Now, let me say that again, according to standard interpretation, 26,000 to 2 million years for each inch to form in this sedimentary deposit, naturally, by evolutionary processes. He was trying to get out. We call him Mighty Worm because four inches of time, if we use 26,000 times four, mm -hmm. you get less than 100,000. If you use two million times four, he had to remain there eight million years. Give or take. Give or take. <laughs> in place we call him Mighty Worm. That's yep. absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Meaning this discovery has major import and major impact. Mm -hmm. So we have a world-class scholar here observing that and verifying it. Now, First of all, sort of to repeat something that uh, Bao had said earlier in the beginning of the series, uh, there is no evolutionary process, none whatsoever, that produces sedimentation, if that makes sense. Okay, Evolution, the theory of evolution, evolutionary natural selection, none of the, the, the allelic frequencies within a population changing over time do not produce sedimentary rock, ever never they don't he's using evolution as a synonym for an old earth anything that has to do with old earth in this case he's talking about geology somehow that a uh, evolution is synonymous with geological processes which is just outright wrong um but the the if, if you can see where he's going with this okay by talking about this is back to the coccolithophores I went into extreme detail in another part on this which I won't go into again accumulate very slowly on the bottom while they're accumulating things are living there things are burrowing into the sediment clams are living on the sediment um, things like that fish are dying and settling down this kind of stuff happens frequently in, in, these, in these chalk sediments okay um and in this case, mud shrimps burrowed down through it. Now, again, these were not worms. Now, I think this is this is important here. Okay, now because now in this next section, we're gonna he's gonna give us the recreate the scenario. Are a display from an in display in the Royal Terrell Museum in Alberta. This is from the Burgess Shale, and again, multiple fossil worms were found 
bearing vertically through the layers in the Burgess Shale. Even the pressure lines as they work through it have been found. That is marvelous. Now with only moments remaining. Okay, so you hopefully that made sense. And he's envisioning this as a worm. He's envisioning this as a worm who, according to geologic time, is burrowing for millions and millions of years, um, remaining alive and burrowing in, in order to cross this many sedimentary layers. Uh, ignoring the fact that these layers are already there, mud shrimp comes, digs a hole down into it, that mud shrimp dies, hole gets buried, filled with sediment, that fossil hole is preserved inside, yes, traversing many, many, many layers, thousands of years worth of deposition, um, that burrow is cutting through it. Does it's it's simply a stupid thing. Um, it doesn't make any sense what he's trying to say. He's really trying to do the polystrate tree argument and apply it in a unique way to this this ichno fossil. I have a discovery that I'd like to mention to you, and uh, this is the first time this discovery has ever been mentioned publicly. Dr. Jaime Gutierrez and I were excavating uh, in Via de Leva in Colombia, South America, on property that title deed was held to, and simultaneously made the discovery of the rarest ammonite ever. I'll mention this briefly. Uh, because I'm publishing on this technically, I named him Pendulocerus laqueus corrugatum. What on earth am I talking about with a, a creature like this? Well, you'll notice above that shell now I don't know what to say about this. I um, I'm a little hesitant to comment without further information. However, all of my searches, and I don't know exactly when this program was made, um, but there's a couple of things here. Uh, <clears throat> personally, I don't believe for a second that he's describing the species, only because my 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 belief in his in Bao's credibility is, is pretty close to zero. Uh, that's just my that's that that's an opinion of that's a, a personal opinion. Um, but the, some of the reasons, some of the things about it that I found a little bit. Uh, first of all, when you describe a new species, okay, I'm just I'm in the process of describing a new species. Um, actually, when I'm not doing this, I'm actually describing a, a, a type of shrimp. Um, now I won't tell you what the name of that shrimp is. You know why? Because once I make that name public, that counts as its first you know once it once it is published and that can be published in an, any number of form that name is used it that name suddenly becomes part of the of the literature even on this documentary so by using that name on this documentary he invalidates that name for his formal publication of it if that makes sense um, now typically when you're going to describe something you think of a name for it and you might share it with your friends and stuff like that but the idea is nobody will put it in print Nobody will, you know, you don't put out a newsletter going, here's what I'm going to name it. You don't do that. You keep it under your hat for the most part because you don't want it to, you don't want it to be published. Publishing this, he's published the name, he invalidates his own name. Um, and I, I think he really doesn't, I, I, I'm not convinced that he actually is really going to publish anything. And the thing is, is I searched through, um, well, all of my resources looking for any mention of this Pendulocerus, and I can't find anywhere. If anybody out there has an actual link um, to it, I, you know, you know, that that's that would be great. I'd love to see it. Okay, I'm going to finish the series up now. I know it's gotten, it's been way too long again, um, but I'm going to again. Hopefully, if if the response is good, I know this is probably isn't as. I don't think it. I don't like how this one turned out compared to. The, the first one with Russ Miller um, so I'll, maybe I'll try to find a subject matter that's a whole lot more meatier than this one has been for the most part so I'll put links in the crotch bar to everything and I'll see you later thank you